Hello class, this is Mrs. Alston talking about the thoracic spine lecture. So we have already learned that the function of the vertebral column is to enclose and protect the spinal cord. It's located at mid sagittal plane. It forms the posterior aspect of the bony trunk and it extends from the base of the skull to the tailbone. It's divided into five groups. You have the cervical, the thoracic, the lumbar, the sacrum, and the coccyx. Remember that we have seven cervical vertebra, 12 thoracic vertebra, and five lumbar vertebra. A review of the curvatures of the spine, your lumbar and cervical is compensatory, concave, or lordotic, and your thoracic and sacrum is going to be primary, convex, or kyphotic. So here is a diagram of those curves. The lumbar and cervical is concave. It's classified as lordotic. And lordosis is any curve that is concave forward. The thoracic curvature is exaggerated and is called kyphosis or kyphotic. And that's when you have a humpback deformity, which is frequently seen in elderly Caucasian females who have susceptibility to osteoporosis. So here is that exaggerated humpback. This would be kyphosis or kyphotic. And then an exaggerated lumbar or swayback would be lordosis or lordotic. We also talked about the difference between the normal spine running vertically versus it having scoliosis. The image on the right hand side has scoliosis, while the image on the left and the one in the middle is considered normal. Now remember the one in the middle, you can have a slight curve laterally to your dominant hand. That does not mean that you have scoliosis. The joints of the vertebral column are amphiarthrodial between the bodies of each vertebra. It is cartilaginous and it is diarthrodial around the apophyseal joints with a synovial fluid. It's also known as zygoapophyseal joints or your Z joints. So looking at our palpable landmarks, make sure that you are fully aware of where your landmarks are. But your vertebral prominence is going to be at the level of C7, T1. Your jugular notch is going to be at the level of T2, T3. Your sternal angle will be at the level of T4, T5. The mid portion of your chest is going to be at C7. And then your xiphoid process or ensiform tip is going to be at T9, T10. So the thoracic spine has some characteristics special to themselves. As I said, there's 12 thoracic spine and each one of them has an articulation for the ribs, which articulate with the thoracic spine posteriorly. Their spinous processes are also longer than the cervical and the lumbar, and they overlap the body of the vertebra below. So as you see on this diagram, the spinous process extends down beyond the body of the vertebra below it. So our typical vertebra that we have talked about in the cervical spine lecture, we have two main components. We have the body anteriorly and we have the vertebral arch posteriorly. The arch is attached to the body via the pedicles on either side at the posterior lateral aspect of the body. Then you have the lamina that acts as a bridge between the transverse process and the spinous process. You have the superior articular process and the inferior articular process, and they sit in between the transverse process and the spinous process, extending superiorly and inferiorly. And then you have the vertebral foramen or the spinal foramen. Now remember that is the opening that is created with the fusion of the body to the pedicle. So that spinal foramen or vertebral foramen allows the spinal cord to traverse down the spinal canal. Here once again is just another image showing you color coding of a typical vertebra with the body, the pedicles, the transverse process, the superior and inferior articular processes, the lamina, and the spinous process.
This is a superior view and a lateral view of the typical thoracic spine. Note that the thoracic spine has facets and demi facets, and that's where the bony thorax or the ribs are going to articulate with the thoracic spine. You also see that they have the superior articular facet that is highlighted in that blue, and that is going to articulate with the inferior articular facet or process from the vertebra above, and that creates the apophyseal joints. Just underneath the superior articular facet, you have the inferior vertebral notch, and then on the inferior vertebra below it, you'll have the superior vertebral notch, and when those two structures come together, they form the intervertebral foramen. So here's the actual articulation between the thoracic vertebra and the rib. You'll note that the costo vertebral joint is made from the head of the rib articulating with the facets or demi facets on the thoracic vertebra. So that's the costo transverse or the costo vertebral joint. The costo transverse joint is the articulation of the turbicle on the rib with the transverse process on the thoracic vertebra. And this diagram shows you how that articulation occurs. Now, as a reminder, we have intervertebral discs that sit in between each vertebra and they act as shock absorbers. And a herniated disc is when the nucleus propulsus, which is the center of the of the disc itself, when it tries to protrude out, it will push on the annulus fibrosus, which is the outer stronger layer, and that could push into the spinal canal, which could impinge the spinal cord, and it could be causing numbness or tingling sensations or pain in the upper or lower extremities. Now, as I said, the joints and uh, foramen that we're going to be interested in looking at is going to be the zygoapophyseal joints or apophyseal joints and the intervertebral foramen. So remember the zygoapophyseal joints are formed from the superior articular process and inferior articular process. And then the intervertebral foramen are formed from the superior vertebral notch and the inferior vertebral notch. So it takes two vertebra for each one of those structures to be demonstrated. So for our general positions of the thoracic spine, our routine is going to be an AP, a lateral, and a swimmers. And the trauma is going to be the AP, cross table lateral, and swimmers. So for your AP T-spine, think about your chest x-ray. This can be done either erect or on the table using the table buggy. If you have the patient laying supine, I would use a thin pillow up underneath the head because you do not want to uh, create a greater curve at the superior portion of your T-spine. The central ray is going to be between C6 and T7, so think of like a chest X-ray. Have about an inch and a half of light above the shoulders to ensure that you have from C7 down through T12, L1. It's gonna be a 40 inch SID. You're going to have your collimation open head to toe and then cone in side to side just to cover your T-spine. You want to make sure that you have all of the costal facets on your image. So make sure that you haven't clipped um, your articulation with the cartilage of your sternum. And you also want to see the costal vertebral and costal transverse joint posteriorly. So T6, T7, and mid-sagittal plane, about an inch and a half of light on a sthenic patient above the shoulders. Collimate in side to side. Make sure that you place your marker anatomically correct. I usually do it like a chest x-ray and put it up at the top shoulder in the light field. Make sure that you're shielding your patient in the gonadal area. This is going to be on suspended respiration. So here you should see from at least C7 down to the entire T12, um, preferably the top of L1. So I would have collimated or I would have moved my central ray down a little bit further to get the space between T12 and L1 and have maybe a, the upper portion of L1 on there. You should be able to see the spinous processes in the center of the thoracic body. You should be able to see the pedicles equal distance on either side of the body. You should see the articulation of the ribs to the sternum. 
or to the vertebral column. Uh, you should see the heart shadow in the center. You should see the trachea running down with the um, carina, the bifurcation of the trachea. So you should be able to see all those things on your radiograph with no motion. Now the lateral T spine. So this is the lateral thoracic spine. As I said, you could do this either erect or on the table. So it's like the lateral chest x-ray, except for we're going to have a 40 inch SID for this. We are going to center at about three to four inches below the jugular notch or at the level of T7. You're going to be slightly posterior from mid coronal plane to ensure that you're not clipping the back of the thoracic spine. Ensure that your patient is in a true lateral position so you see no rotation. And if you do, it can't be any greater than uh, 0.5 centimeters or one inch in, in difference between the posterior ribs. You can do this using a orthostatic breathing technique, or you can do it with the patient suspended on full inspiration. However, the breathing technique will get rid of the ribs around the thoracic spine, so it'll help to blur those. When you're looking at your image, you wanna make sure that you have all of the uh, T12 and you can look at the last set of ribs coming off now you're not really going to be able to count T1, 2, 3, or 4 because it's going to be naturally superimposed by the shoulders. But as long as you can see at least T12, L1 and work your way up, then you're going to have the swimmers to see the superior portion of the thoracic spine. So you should be able to best demonstrate the intervertebral joint spaces, the thoracic vertebral bodies. You should be able to see the intervertebral foramen running down and open. So this image right here, the patient is rotated greater than that one inch. So we would have to repeat it, ensuring that the patient was in a true lateral position. And then I would also bring my central ray a little bit further back to ensure I'm not clipping any of the posterior aspect of the T-spine or the ribs. Now here's it demonstrating on the table you see that because the patient spine did not stay horizontal running down the table, they put a sponge to help build it up so that the joint spaces would remain open in between the vertebra. The other black item that they have back there is a lead strip to capture any of the scatter, although we really don't need to do that anymore with the DR systems because the computer can recognize it and clean it up. I would mark anterior to your part on the lateral. So put your marker in the front, maybe up at the shoulders. So it's out of pertinent anatomy. If you put it back posteriorly behind the patient, it may be too dark back there and you may not be able to identify your marker. Make sure that you're shielding the gonadal area for males and females. So here, this is a better lateral T-spine. You can see that they can visualize T2 down through L1, and I would just look to see the last set of ribs coming off of T12 to ensure that you have all the thoracic vertebra. And you're supposed to be best identifying the intervertebral foramen, the bodies of the vertebra in lateral position or profile. You should be able to see the intervertebral disc space open, and you can see the posterior ribs superimposed on top of each other, and the spinous processes are going to be in profile as well. The swimmer's method. Now remember with the cervical spine, I said the swimmer's was performed if you could not see the anterior articulation between C7 and T1. But with the swimmer's, because you cannot see the upper portion of the T-spine in the lateral position because of the shoulders, you perform the swimmer's with every T-spine exam. It's only the cervical spine that you may or may not do the swimmer's based on what you can identify on your lateral cervical spine. So for the swimmers, for the T-spine, it's going to be the same concept. You're going to have the left arm raised up over the head. The right arm is going to be reaching down like trying to grab for your shoelaces. This is going to separate the humeral heads away from the upper portion of the T-spine. You should have light filled at the EAM and work your way down. And you should be able to count through to T4 to make sure that you can see that on the radiograph still going to be a 40 or a 72 inch SID. 
you're going to center one inch above the juggler notch or about at the level of T1 and running down the EAM. So that is the lecture for the thoracic spine.